Roger Williams University is hosting a crisis management seminar on May 3rd at their Providence campus. Crises, whether a natural disaster, cyber attack, or financial instability, can have severe repercussions if not handled properly. This is where crisis management plays a pivotal role. Join Roger Williams' MBA students and expert speakers to learn how to prepare for the unexpected. The program is totally free and open to the public. You can register online at rwu.edu slash events slash crisis dash management dash symposium. This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Carr. I'm a multi-hyphenate artist based in Brooklyn. I grew up in D.C. Shout out to my mom. Uh, but I, I make music. I produce. I rap. I do poetry, take photos, work at community community center. Um, I've been doing diversity, equity and inclusion work for, I don't know, a long, 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 long time uh, professionally, but also in my private life. I, I want to make sure all the humans you know, are able to express themselves and enjoy each other and spread this love around the planet. And uh, we'll get into some of the specifics, but I'm I'm 44. I'm turning 45 in January. So I like to think I've, I've dabbled in a lot of different arenas. <laughs> <laughs> That's like an impressive feat in and of itself. It's always something that I've admired about you is that you've found really different ways to have an identity and make a living and just exist in an artistic life, you know, in an independent way. That's like how I've always seen you is like, all right, I'm just going to, I'm going to sort of exist within the, the, the New York or national or global, whatever community of, of art, but do my own thing and find a way to make it happen. And you've just like continued to do that and evolve over the, the, I, I was trying to think about when we first met, I was, I have this viv- like vivid memory. I think it was 2007, when you first showed up at the McKibben Lofts and I was with Katie Ng, great yeah. painter and musician. And she was like, oh, these guys are moving in. Yeah. And I was like, oh, awesome. Great. <laughs> <laughs> so 2007, now it's basically 2023. So in that time frame, I've watched you evolve and like tackle these huge projects that are just like stunningly complex and ter- even just like booking your festival but all the while just growing and you're, you know, you are who you are, no matter what medium you're in, no matter what project you're in. So like, talk about that, like just building your own artistic identity in an independent manner. Wow. That that's who I think <laughs> first the, the supportive community is number one. And, and I don't mean the idea of like a community I built or that I'm responsible for. I mean, like literally the other people I was around at every point in my life have been so supportive and inspiring. Um, I think the difficult times in my life when I was younger is where I didn't see that support. I didn't see people that were doing things that inspired me. I didn't see a future for myself working with those people or having like-minded ideas. Um, and definitely by the time I got to, to Brooklyn, I was probably upper twenties, like close to 28 or 29, um, I had been doing music for a little while. I had already started to explore other genres. I've been making hip hop since maybe college. Um, but definitely by grad school, a little after I, I'd like branching out and meeting people that played with live bands, soul music. And definitely by 2007, I was getting into like appreciating uh, acoustic music and not just like older rock music, but like appreciating live bands. I lived with a dude who's an instrument punk band. I went to a Dillinger Escape cl- uh, Dillinger Escape Plan show yeah. in a house in in uh, where Rutgers is. Where is that? New Brunswick. Mm-hmm. Yo, it was the scariest show I've ever been in. Also, one of the best. <laughs> Yeah. Like this is a stadium type group in a basement DIY space. It was insane, yeah. you know, and, and seeing that energy. So by the time I got to Brooklyn and I got to McKibben, I was excited by the fact that not everyone rapped. Um, I was excited by when I saw you play um, your the uniqueness of it. Like like I, it was the first time I was around musicians of all types that were not trying to just do what was on television or on the radio. They could. And they, some of them were more oriented to popular music or more oriented to um, trying to get signed or work with entertainment companies. But other folks are on some like, yo, I sit in front of the building and play a guitar for three hours straight. And I'm at first looking like, and I got to be honest, like, I, you know, I came from a background where you don't sit on the ground and like there's certain things publicly. And I think partly just being honest, being a black man, I'm concerned with how I present in public because of the police, because if other people think I'm loitering, they might call the cops on me or who knows what. 
Um, and I loved that sense of freedom and comfort. And like, of course, I sit in front of the building. This is where we live. Like, don't you sit on your front porch, you know, right. and you're getting broken down into like, this isn't about a scene. It's literally people that live in a building that make stuff all the time. And my relationship fell apart that I had moved up to New York for in 2008. And um, Potion was my my respite. Like when I first started performing, I'd be crying at the shows because literally my life and my mind in a certain way was falling apart. Like within the first six months of like working with Potion. And I hadn't really been doing it because my my girlfriend I moved up here with didn't like open mics and, and the indie scene at all. She worked for a PR company where she was repping Heineken and Pepsi. I was doing photo stuff for some of her clients and companies. So I'm in the Interscope party, come home to then do the open mic and love the open mic much more. Yeah, But I needed to pay rent. Open mic wasn't going to pay the rent, but me shooting that Interscope event and I'm still meeting musicians. I'm still getting in the buildings. So I think having that inspiration and community and seeing that like, nah, you can make the art and the music you want and trying to like just being scared and being like, yo, I'm going to get evicted if I don't find some money. Right. And so I tried just about anything you can imagine that's legal and that I had the skill set for, I had the like access to. So whether it was physical, manual labor, done it. Whether it was office jobs, done it. Working veterinary clinics, done it. Whether it was uh, piping and drape, you know, for an AV company, done it. But in everything, I want to try to learn something that will feed back into my art, my music, the stuff we're doing independently, how to structure and organize. Um, and at every level, I just kept meeting people that were like, you know, at one point I met the woman that had started Glasslands and I was like, wait, you what? What are you doing? She's like, well, I did it. We sold it. And now I'm going to go to Asia and learn new things about my life. And it was so wild seeing a person that was 10 years, 15 years ahead of me. You know, if you can categorize things like that in linear sure. progress, but where they came in, they had a plan, they did it, they rocked out. And when Brooklyn started going whack, they were like, bet I'm moving to Asia. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds perfect. You know, and and then that inspired me like, OK, well, now we have an art space like she donated an amp to our art space. And so, like, I'm part of a, a process like at the G and and with what you're doing up in Rhode Island, like the homies are still doing what the homies have been doing. And and when I see that. But now the homies have a show with PBS. Now the other homies, have <laughs> right. you know, a, a organic farm. Now the other homies have their own art space. And. That constantly pushes me to then develop new skills, to follow my creative interests, um, and and try to the the to like <clears throat> never look up and hate what I'm doing. Like like if if we're gonna make art as a living, I should love it. It's not an engineering job. It's not something where I'm going just for money. And if I focus on what do I love about this stuff, and and what drives me crazy, stay away from the crazy stuff, and really focus on what I love. And if I if I stay up late enough and if I talk to enough people, there's some money to be exchanged. <laughs> right. That's such an interesting point is that you should do it for the love, because if you're not going to do it for the love, then why not just do something that's high paying but miserable and and just get in and out as fast as you can? And you mentioned Potion there. The listeners Potion was. I don't even know how to describe it. It was it really this organic community that we were both a part of that came out of, there was a cafe called the AKA Potion Cafe at 248 McKibben Street in Brooklyn. And it was this like tiny space, super DIY, like they had bagels and coffee, but that was kind of secondary to just being a community space. And there was an open mic every Monday night. And I've talked about this on the podcast in the past, but it's it was such an important moment because every Monday, this open mic took place. There was no PA system. There were no frills. And that place would be packed. And everybody brought just pure emotion, like you said, to the table. And I was going through a lot of stuff at that point as well. And I was so moved by your performances. And it was just like, from one Monday to the next, how can you just bring it? How can you just create something either fresh or just reimagine what you're doing and just constantly workshop new songs, workshop new new performances, whatever the case may be, and get that community feedback. And it created this really organic um, scene, like, tr like a true scene, and, and yeah. that basically was destroyed by real estate speculation. And the New York Times did a cover story on it, and that basically destroyed it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, when, you, when you asked earlier about um, uh, maybe the growth in me adapting and like finding other 
uh, ways to express myself creatively. A lot of it was due to necessity. So when I moved into McKibben, yeah, there were a lot of musicians, but almost nobody rapped. Now, there was a a, a music studio where I, either Lil Mo or like a, a rapper who got on the radio had worked out of it. And Crunk Tesla, who's a DJ, he came up with a DJing transcription system right on. Um, he lived in the building. But also, if you try to record with him, it'll take you three weeks to get a one hour session. Yeah. So it wasn't a lot of rap. So I showed an open mic. I got my CD. This is again back in the day. So I had my CD with the instrumental. And they looking like, what, what do you want us to do with that? I was like, well, how do I play my instrumental? They're like, no, no, no. There's like a guitar amp and a mic. And one time there was no guitar amp. And I'm like, what? 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 How do I perform? <laughs> and so then I, I'm like, all right, get smart. Get an aux cable. And I start running my own sound. This is back when people used to still bring DJs sometimes to the shows, if you're a rapper. So I was so lost and didn't know what to do. And then it's like, wait, I got to figure out who to play with. And I remember one time I'd seen you, I'd seen a couple other people play. And I was like, yo, I can rap to that. Some of the acoustic stuff, I can't rap to that. At the time, I had not developed enough to be able to accommodate, you know? And the people I was meeting weren't versed enough in hip hop for me to be like, play this root song in guitar, though. You know, it just we came from these worlds. That was awesome to then say, yo, Bill, can you just play something and I'll try to rap? And I had not really done that. And learning how to do that and having the the synergy of watching two musicians really organically converge and it not be for the idea we need to make a song for the radio we need to record this we need to have an album but yo it's humans in a space with the instrument sharing emotions i love that you know and so then when good friend electric opens when the cloud opens when the g is doing stuff when what turns into wayward social starts becoming the house for potion when um kahan spot all these places i had to learn how to present my art in a new manner because they weren't accommodating me. It was like, we rock together and whatever the setup is, we lucky we have the space to do it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's so true. So I, I really dug that. And, and I think that pushed me so that later in life, when things changed, altered, or when spaces weren't going to accommodate me, I learned to be like, what do you, how do y'all do things? Cool. I can do this, do this, this, this. Okay. Over here, y'all do it this way. I can bring the burlesque. I can bring the fire. Okay. Y'all don't do fire. Okay. We'll bring in the live bands and we'll do this. Okay. Circus over here. And, and I think I, I'm a curious person. I'm, I'm into the birds, the animals, the trees, the machinery, but I can't build anything, right? Like I'm into so many things, but I want to try it. I want to dabble. I want to see like what, what's going on. I want to talk to the people who love it. Um, and then I might, you know, like a little bumblebee float away to something else and, and do that. But I am consistent. I've rapped since I was like 19 for real. I've been making music for real, like day to day, every day. I'm working on my art, my photo stuff, my involvement in this land project. There are certain things that are consistent. And then there are a lot of things where I, I like to enjoy the the human experience of, a, you know, experiment. Yeah. And you mentioned something there. That, I mean, really, this whole conversation is is in some ways comes back to this idea. And you also mentioned Kahan, Kahan James, who is an, an artist and producer and and DIY space operator in Bushwick that um, is the one time says something really profound to me, which is income streams. He just looked looked me in the eye because it was like you, when you're an indie musician, you the last thing you want to do is start making corporate music because you're like, then it just becomes music becomes a dreadful experience. You know, sure. OK, if you if someone came to you and was like, look, I'm going to put you on a ride where you're guaranteed to have exposure to millions of people and um, you know, it's like, even then I'm not sure that I would take that because you, you want to just, you want to get there through your own identity. But at the same time, especially being in a place like New York, you need to find ways to, to actually sustain. And as an artist, you can create whatever it is that you want as your primary identity, primary project. If you're able to generate enough money through the industry whether it's photography or, you know, in my case, broadcasting, whatever the case may be, like there's ways to like bring in dollars without then saying, all right, I'm going to go audition for American Idol or something. You know what I mean? That's that's so key. And and it's difficult to find that. I think that took me a long time. I don't come from a background of musicians, artists. My mom is an attorney. She worked at Howard University. So she was an attorney that didn't make a whole bunch of money. 
So understand my starting point of life's not about money. It's you, you serve, you work in community. If there, if we don't care about young black children, who's going to, if we don't care about these young women out here, who's going to, if we don't care about young trans folks, who's going to. And so it can't just be about money, but my family's from the, you're supposed to be a doctor, lawyer, teacher, engineer, or you can be a garbage person, but you better own that company. And, and so the idea of making art was so foreign. So I went through grad school. I studied medieval studies. I worked for a couple of years. And by 25, it hit me like I have to spend time doing music, like for real, for real. I spent so much of my life reading other people's books, writing papers to solve other people's quandaries and prove to them I know something, you know, whatever ridiculousness of higher education. But I learned a lot that I could then put into my art. But I didn't have time to put it into my art. I had all this stuff in my brain that I wanted to share with people, but I'm at work all day and then tired. And then when I throw shows, I can't put all my effort in the shows and I'm wanting to go to sleep under my desk at work. I was working in admissions at Howard University and realized like I have to put all this effort into art and music. So I went hard and was like, you know, wasn't in the most stable of situations financially for a couple of years, but I put time into music. I learned to record myself. I learned to record other people. I learned how to run equipment. I learned AV, you know, run through it, photo, video work. I really threw myself into the fire. And I wouldn't say everyone needs to do that. There's some people who can transition. And while they're at work, they start writing their book. But for me, I needed that same amount of time I put into other people's dreams into myself. And I went really deep into that. And once I started, I realized I couldn't go back. I'd, I'd been unhappy in different parts of my life due to not having a goal. And I don't mean like a singular goal of what success might be, but like not having something that was moving me. Like I was being moved by other people telling me what potential was and saying, you could be this. You're going to want to do this in the future. You're not going to want this. So why don't you do these things now? And when I finally really hit on like music and art and the community around hip hop and the people I was meeting and the way you can learn about the world and share with the world and the other things you have to learn how to do, that was it. It was like, I have to do this full time. And I could not figure out how to make money. At one point, you know, I was dating a woman who I was dating a, a woman who was an escort. And I didn't know really at the time. And through our relationship, found out uh, she told me she wasn't having sex with people. But who knows? But I know I was so desperate to make money. She was like, yo, you can make money with me if you just ride and go with me to the cause and wait out in the car in case something goes wrong. And I'm like, yo, I'm not security. I can't help if anything happens. She's like, no, no, you don't. call. It's just if I don't come out by a certain time, you know, to call somebody, call my boss. And. People who know me now know that like, oh, Chris, you open all types of lifestyles. But back in 2005, four, when this was happening, that was desperation. That was me being like, yo, I quit my day job. I'm not making money out of my music studio. I'm not going to do other things that are illegal. I got a homie who's like, here's how you make money. And I did it, you know, and that's pushed me to be like, I can't be doing this. I'm, You know, and so each thing yeah. that happened pushed me to figure out a better way. And then it's like, fine, I'm gonna get a job at AB company. And then it's like, yo, I'm not, this is heavy. I'm gonna hurt my back carrying stuff for other people. If I'm gonna carry the PA, it gotta be for us. Yes. You know, and at the <laughs> totally. time I started meeting people who were like, well, then carry the PA. We got a spot, but you're gonna have to help us. You have to mop, you're gonna have to clean up. You're gonna have to do the promotion, make the flyer. And I was hyped about, about that. I was excited mm -hmm. about that, you know? And, and so I think, a lot of it is, is I don't have another choice. Like I, I've, you know, a pretty simple way of looking at it, stay alive. Don't go crazy in that process. Be a good person to the best of my ability and then try to make money. Now, how do you do all that? Like, like stay sane, be a good person and make the bread and then make the bread doing art. Well, then you better learn how to do art in a number of different ways. So you can be of service to other artists who are getting uh, taken advantage of financially, you know, by the other people doing their photos or doing their video and overcharging them and giving them bad quality work and who don't understand the culture. You know, you can help by booking shows for the homies and making sure that they get what's equitable or that you give them a stage that they normally couldn't get and that you're not doing pay for play. You know, there are tons of ways you can make money doing art. If, if it's your personality, you can go to a bar and say, hey, let me use your space for free. I won't change anything. I'll bring a bunch of people and you give me a cut of the bar sales if you get above a certain amount and a bar will say wait we don't change anything you bring a bunch of people and we just give you a tiny amount of extra money that we make sure 
And then you take that money and then you go buy some equipment and you meet up with the homie, you throw shows in your homie's apartment, and then you do the stuff you like. Yeah. But if you don't like doing shows in your apartment, if you don't like throwing birthday parties for your friends at bars, if you don't like working at a veterinary clinic, if you don't like, well, then you got to find a balance of what are you willing to do that you don't like that allows you to do what you love. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, for me, it was like, I was temping. First, I was a paralegal. Then I was temping in offices. And I was like, I can't go into a nine to five scenario in Manhattan every day. So then it's like delivering vegetables to the farmer's markets in a truck, you know, refereeing soccer games. You know, it just goes on and on and on doing AV work, you know, doing bar back work, you know, all these and all at the same time, like four or five things happening, plus being in a band trying to make music. Yeah. And at some point you're, you're right. It just kind of starts to click and you're like, all right, what's, what's worth it to do in terms of financial, what's worth it to do in terms of creative. And you find that balance. And that's like the modern just reality. Of course, you know, being at McKibben and just in general, even here in Rhode Island, I see it, but there's, there's always gonna be like trust fund people. And you're like, all right. And once in a while, those people, you know, we, we had some people that were around us that like did make great art and they were just kind of hanging around all day you know, but most I have found that the hustle actually inspires art way more than if you were just to, someone was like, here's a million dollars. Be your, you know, I'll be your patron. Just hang out and and make art. Something about that hustle feeds into your work and it feeds into the product that you put out in, in various mediums. For me, one of it is uh, I, I don't really have much concern for audience. Right. Like I'm I'm a cathartic uh, based artist. And like, I make art to keep myself healthy. And there's this other part of it. That's totally about sharing it with people and totally about the exchange. But in rap, one of the elements is like, I can't allow audience to dictate what I rap about, or else I might be saying things that I find to be negative in the black community that might be negative towards women that might be closed minded when it comes to non-black people. And I have to be able to say what I feel, which means sometimes the audience doesn't want to hear it. I can't get trapped into do you like my music or not as the reason I'm making it? But I do have to consider if I need money, are you going to buy my shit? Sorry, are you going to buy my stuff? Like if it's okay, this won't, this won't, uh, we're not sub subject to FCC uh, okay. violations. So I should have uh, noted that at the top here. <laughs> all right, so awesome. Um, can... So like if I am doing a show and I'm going to pay my rent based on how many people buy tickets, well, then I better book artists that are going to bring enough people out so that I can pay them, pay for the space and go home with rent money. Yeah. If I'm going to put money into my own art, did I do the equation on, is it possible to recoup or am I just aimlessly being a samurai in the woods, hacking away with no goal? You know, like desperation is real. And I don't want to push the narrative that starving art is better or that it's necessary or anything. I'm, I'm a fan of, be happy and be sane. It's mm -hmm. awesome to be able to make art while you're happy. It does not require me to be miserable and going through everything. But I also know uh, in my life, quote unquote, what people look at as sane or not might be fluid and flexible. And that art and doing art and sharing it with people is very important in me understanding where I am and my mental health situation and where I'd want to be as I grow. Uh, but the making money part is directly, do people like it? Like, is it dope? Did I really kill it when I'm up there performing? And if I did, people buy more of my albums, people buy the t-shirts, people buy the books. Did I really practice and rehearse and prepare myself to be in the best situation when I present to people? Do I go out on the street and can I freestyle well enough on the corner so that people coming out the train station are like, bruh, you're dope. Even though <laughs> yeah. I never heard you, here's 20 bucks and I don't need anything back. When I go on tour and people let me sleep on my couches, are they like, yo, the energy you brought was so refreshing. And like the people you with are so awesome that instead of you having to pay $150 to stay somewhere, anytime you come to this city, you got a place to stay. And like, I think all that stuff runs together at a certain point. I can't do anything just for money, but, but recognizing that like, yo, if you really smash in a certain way and you really put your heart out on the stage, there are some people that show support with money. There's some people that show support with, I'm going to give you a hug. I'm going to look you in the face. I'm going to cry. I'm going to tell you some story from when I was younger. I'm going to introduce you to the homie. There's so many ways that people show love. Um, and so it's, it's an interesting puzzle or game to be like, from the people who show love by exchanging money over the people that view what I do as a service, how do I do 
what I do, love it, and then maximize the capital return and not be relying on it so that if you don't like the music, cool, I did some DEI work. Uh, you cool, I did some photo work. You know, cool, I did some sound for somebody else. Cool, I did some photo editing for somebody. You know, and and it and if somebody's disrespectful, I can always walk away. No one holds the, the keys in my apartment. That's right. Um, something we were talking about before we started recording is just the kind of change in really just specifically music, but I think art spaces in general since COVID hit and during COVID doesn't even really count because obviously that was just like no during the thick of COVID was really yeah. 2020, early 2021. It's like hard to even count that in. But since then, there's been this shift and it's matches up with real estate changes. I know you're about to, at least that you've posted that you're about to leave the McKibben Street lofts. You're like yeah. the last person, like the last ambassador from the old guard that's there. And so it's heartbreaking <laughs> that you're leaving. But we see this in other places. I see it here in Rhode Island where it's like Newport was this amazing city with like a really viable indie rock community, hip hop scene. And now it's like all Airbnb. Barely anybody lives there. Providence is threatened by this as well. And when I try to book in Brooklyn now, it's a lot different than it was back in 2018. We could play the Mercury Lounge or Knitting Factory or Shea Stadium, these big venues. They would let us come and we would do a solid show. Plus, we would do a lot of DIY events in apartments or lofts or whatever it is. That's totally changed now. And it feels like you said something before we started recording. It's like, do people actually want to have music spaces? And I wonder, as someone who promotes, you have a, a, a very popular and successful festival that takes place at the end of every summer, Brooklyn Wildlife Summer Festival. You know, you you throw all these shows, you're in it in so many different angles as a performer, as a promoter, as a, an event photographer, um, as just like a, an ambassador from the older, and I don't mean that in terms of age, just sort of the vibe of of Brooklyn to the the new generation. What what are you seeing? What do you what are you experiencing in terms of a change in the community and the willingness to take a chance from the standpoint of venue operators? And also obviously that implies to like the real estate shift where where do people live and throw these types of events now? I mean, you just sent chills up my spine, like that that who's willing to take the chance? And when I moved to Brooklyn, one of the things that I noticed most was the fearlessness and the people who were, I don't even know, like what is uh, opposite of risk averse, but the people who are adrenaline, like fanatics, like go hard. And so I first got out to Brooklyn in the Williamsburg area around 2003. Um, there was a venue called Black Betty and it was closing yeah. around 2002 or 2003. And Williamsburg was frightening in the sense of, I was living in Harlem, I was going to grad school at Columbia. So I was never in Brooklyn. I come out there, it's factories. People were not living out there at that point. And over near Kent Avenue, like near the water, it was desolate. And the people out, you saw, you know, for me, how I grew up, it was like, be careful, because the only people out at this time are the people who rob people and the people who are getting robbed, you know? And it and it just wasn't inhabited in that Northern part, like South, South Williamsburg had a, a strong ethnic community. But now, when I walk around, you see the high-rise condos, buildings. It's not even for, like, young gentrify. It's like, no, you need to be doctor, lawyer, or advertising exec. Like, it's major up there now. So that's 20 years. The world's supposed to change in 20 years. Cities are supposed to grow and change in 20 years. But the real estate and the cost has ballooned in a way that doesn't keep up with how much money people make, let alone how much money artists can make. And so one of the things that allowed for McKibben, the factories got converted. Most, quote unquote, regular people didn't want to live there. And the artists would move in and make the spaces themselves. Like they would build out the spaces. They would do their own carpentry, their own work. And when I got to, to McKibben, I was like, you're not allowed to do this. Like, this is unbelievable. And <laughs> right. for whatever reason, the building department didn't come in there and stop them. And so <laughs> exactly. then I was like, they let you do this? Then we're building a stage and we had a stage in our apartment, bro. Like, like yeah. in Aaron's apartment in the in the bottom floor of 255 McKibben, like full out stage, wood stage, <laughs> club speakers in the crib. James Watson and them had a, a club PA with a rack system with amps where I, you can hear it in the elevator. You know yes. what I'm saying? Like that level of I don't you can't stop me. Right. And and then with good friend electric Tyler and them. Every week, like Marty, after three weeks, was like, we're going to not renew your lease and we'll get you kicked out. He was like, cool, I'm throwing a party every weekend until I get kicked out. And so we in there every week. 
And and if people got put out, they just moved to another building where you do the same thing because there were options. I remember when you had the spot on Waterbury, it yep. was like, what? I got photos from that 4th of July. You're not allowed to do that. I've got the poster for that show up on my wall. And I try to look at that as often. Anytime I'm feeling down, I look at the poster from that show and I go, we did that. Y'all did that. We did that. You know, you know what I mean? Hundreds of people in that pickle factory or whatever it was. But we had we built the stage and like you said, club speakers, lighting system, and we got away with it because the alternative was desolation and useless abandoned spaces. Exactly. Like when when you're in the arenas, no one else wants you're able to, I think, explore and be creative um, in a fashion that's really unique. And again, this is all rooted also in time and development and, and Telios in that. If September 11th hadn't happened and Dumbo and the rezoning hadn't happened, that ripple effect, who knows how New York would have developed. If Bloomberg and Giuliani and these other people didn't do their cleanup and like start whitewashing New York, who knows if we would have ended up with Brooklyn then developing the way that it did. Mm -hmm. So part of what allowed for me was the growth, the change, the real estate changes, which pushed people out of lower Manhattan, pushed people out of Tribeca, pushed people out of these areas where the art had been strong and into Brooklyn. I caught that wave of then 2000, like one, not ready for it. I go down to DC around 2003 or four. My friend Aaron moves to Brooklyn in 2005 or six. I come back up and they doing a party on the roof of McKibben. And I'm like, I've never seen this in my life. This is bananas. Y'all got fire spinners, DJs. What? People sitting with their feet dangling off the roof. What? This is in DC, cops, and they will ID everybody and people are going to jail. You know, like I couldn't believe what was happening. And there were people living eight deep in a three person apartment. The graffiti on the wall was not like Tats crew or, you know, high level graffiti. It was literally like curse words and, you know, testicles, like, like bad <laughs> graffiti. And I'm like, you're not allowed to do this in your apartment. And people are like, no, what do you mean allowed? This is what we do here. And that, that resilience and that sense of we will make it what we want it to be was so inspiring and the neighbors couldn't complain because they louder it was it was literally a run dmc music video with aerosmith where like one band is like yo stop and you know what i'll just turn it up well then i'll turn it up you know and and so i'm getting excited just thinking about oh it. i love it, was, it yeah it's great it was so vibrant and it was you didn't have to go call the homie to come over like that it was you walk out in front of potion yo what you doing at four o'clock bet i'll come up to the cloud Yo, what are you doing on Friday? Yo, you playing a good friend? Cool, I'll see you down there. Yo, what, oh, we got a show with You Say USA at the other homie. Oh, bet, now we're expanding. And then once you had that network of DIY artists who started doing their DIY venues and spaces, now we in other people's buildings, we're in other people's spots, and it really starts circulating. And some of us start being able to play venue venues and being able to bring people out. And, and Shea Stadium and these in-between kind of spaces. And that was vibrant to me. Live music was vibrant. CMJ was dope. Uh, there were all these independent kind of uh, platforms that then grew. And when they grew, people started chasing that. And then we started losing the DIY space. When CMJ starts dealing with major label artists, that's not college music anymore. Mm -hmm. And now when the labels are looking at college music, who, what, are the, what are the college music people doing? They look into the labels and real money instead of looking at us dirt bags, you know, because we were we were dirty and smelly, bro. And like, right. You know, <laughs> it was, it was, so it was two and three day bin bingers and like people really being off the hook, like no DIY, like we're unbridled, we're unmanageable. And that sense, though, allowed for art to grow and collaboration to grow in a certain sense. Once it, it the, the real estate, the price goes up, you're not eight deep in a three bedroom apartment. Once you rent so much that if you get kicked out and you lose your eight year old lease, you can't move anywhere else. So now you can't throw parties in the crib anymore. Once the landlords start threatening and you know your rent's 1800 and if you move, it's 2400 somewhere else, you, you're not risking getting kicked out of your apartment anymore. You know, once the new people come in and they're like, yo, I heard McKibben was so dope. And it's like, cool, you make art? No, 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 I, I, I uh, am a designer for this company. I get up and go to work at 637 in the morning. So I need to shut the hell up. Well, That's I thought right. you said it was so dope what we do. No, no, no. And the idea is dope. If y'all do that on a Saturday night, once every four months, I'll come to your party. Otherwise, I'm calling the cops on y'all. Like, hold on, y'all calling the cops. What are you talking about? This used to be the building where people just showed up every Friday to see where the party was at. There were three different parties in each building. And now it's neighbors really calling the cops, like like really, really not when there's a fight, not when there's a problem. But like 
And now you got the cops involved. Who wants to deal with the cops? So now people don't want to throw parties as much. And you can just keep adding this on. As the rent jumps from like right now, it's $4,600 to move into the apartment next door to me. No Same way. size as mine. Yep. An open format apartment, $4,600. My rent is twenty five dollars to $2,600. When I moved in, it was $1,800. So you think like four years ago, six years ago, when they were like, you keep throwing parties, we're kicking you out. I was willing to risk that. I was like, nope, no more parties. I'm paying twenty five hundred. My neighbor at that point was paying thirty two hundred. I can't do that. You know, I can't move somewhere else. And and then when you think of what the venues pay, the the rent for commercial space, bro, uh, uh, less than thousand, less than eight hundred square foot store is fifteen hundred. If you want a bar club venue, these people are paying eight thousand, fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars a month rent. Yeah. They do not care about indie anything. They're like, yo, put on a baseball game, pay the licensing fee, and charge all these people to drink and watch baseball. <sighs> 70 times a, a year, basketball, 40 times a year, football, you know, and it, and it's and and I don't think people to get to your first question, want to go into live music as a business, you make mo- more money selling coffee, you make more money, you know, run down the list now with the internet. Um, and, and so I'm seeing it venues open that don't have the equipment for live music. They don't have the staff to support live music. They don't have bookers. They don't have promoters. They don't have the love for it. Like the people who inspired me like like the homie who i you know i have to talk to them about putting them in in interviews but the homie who who started glasslands they love art and music we did shows out in la like four years ago you know like after they moved and traveled the world they still are making weird experimental music you know the the homies that you know inspired me and at house of yes they're still doing it you know but they now have investors and they moved to a serious venue and they can't do the same things the way they did it before and now it's forty dollars sixty dollars eighty dollars to get in now i work with them and i rock with them so they have nights to make sure it's accessible to homies like me but you can't they can't do what they did when i came out here 12 years ago it's not possible and and i, I would tell any young person pick up an instrument. I don't care if it's a drum machine. I don't care if it's a computer that uses an instrument and play it with other people. I like being by myself in the crib and being able to make my own stuff, but my life has forever been changed by people like Bill, by the other people I've met through you, through Potion, and seeing what it takes to build community and and to be able to work in concert with people. That means a lot. I feel the same way about you. And honestly, what you just described there, like, I think if I was being honest about it and I've tried to be more like introspective and and not deny my own feelings and and experiences but since the end of that pure era of mckibben street and bushwick i've just been chasing that and i've moved from building to building city to city sometimes a little community will pop up in a place bam whack-a-mole airbnb takes it out Real estate takes it out. Something else. I'm in a building right now. I've got a, a warehouse space that I'm terrified. I mean, they just put up our rent 20%. And like, I'm terrified. Like, what's next? And I, I it is the high, the, 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 the peak that we got to there compared to looking back on it and feeling disconnected from it is it impacts my life in a way that I don't even think I recognize. And in a way it's good because it keeps me hungry. keeps me in this pursuit of I'm going to continue to make music how I want to make it. I'm going to continue to, to, to try to connect to that emotion and that experience that I had. But it's also, it's just sad, especially in this post COVID era where it's like, I've got a new record out. I just want to go. I just want to go back and do it. I just, I'm, I just want to do it. I just want to experience that again more than anything else in the world. And I'm not sure why, but it's, I can't, I I mean, I found it at like your festival. I find it here and there, but it's not like you described it where on any given day, four o'clock in the afternoon, you can be like, oh, Steve Nelson, let's, uh, let's, I want to hear your new song and here's my new song. And then tonight we're, oh, there's a party over here. Well, let's, let's have our bands play there. And just like that impromptu spur the moment reacting and being tested by the universe like are you ready because you never know when this moment's going to come like you might have like the most important performance of your life in five minutes yeah i i think you you hit also on that organic nature of it we didn't have to curate and say so we're going to do this event where we'll bring in a live painter and we'll bring in an artist and we'll bring in this person we'll bring in that and who do you know and that 
we went over to homie's crib and it's like, yo, Katie, can you bring the painting over? Yo, can the other homie come over? Yo, blah, blah. We going over in five minutes. Yo, blah, blah, blah. And, and these things really developed out of living out of, 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 I've been talking to my homie more about culture and I work with young people and trying to define culture is really hard for them. And I realized culture is a, a catch-all for things that are very difficult to really encapsulate, but I get it. It's language, it's customs, it's foods, it's dances and rituals. And But really I'm starting to look at culture more like how bacteria, you know, the idea of a bacteria culture where it's just the organic outgrowth of process. And by people being together, they make culture. And we try to define it afterwards but we were into something that would I don't think can ever be recreated, like like in the yeah. way it was. Now, other cities may have it. It's the same thing may have happened in the Lower East Side or in certain parts of the Bronx or it had it manifest and, and the face of it manifest for eternity. But what we experienced and I wrote a piece called Is It Really Over, where I was managing the exact things that you were, you were mentioning. And you, you've had some unique experiences that you've moved during this time. I've been in New York for yep. the past 14 years. So. I, I kind of found myself a number of years ago, like maybe about six, five or six years ago, being like, what am I doing, yo? Like what what we did can't happen anymore. The real estate's different. The Airbnbs are different. The neighbors are different. The artists are different. Media is different. The internet, live music is different. And in 2019, I got diagnosed with melanoma and a, a pretty rare form of it, which is very dangerous. I was on treatment for 13 months, got my pinky toe amputated. So that stopped everything. Mm -hmm. I stopped drinking. And I was stuck with the like, oh, my goodness, like, what if this is worse than just lose a toe? And so I was facing mortality in a way I've never had to question and deal with. And like, luckily, the, the treatment went well. And luckily, I didn't have horrible yeah. side effects. Um, but my life is forever changed by by that 18 months, you know, a two year time period. And then COVID hit during that. So 2019, I'm going through that in July. COVID hits and then the world stops in a certain way. So that nostalgia is something I've been really, really um, searching through. And to be like, was it real? Like, were the things, am I imagining it in this fantastical, like, no, I look at the pictures. No, we were the wildest month. We, no, no, we did it. <laughs> it was I, I definitely be, real. No. Yeah. It was definitely real. And will it ever be like that again? No. No. And so I take that experience and I say, how do I take the energy of it and prep the next generation and how do I prep myself for our generation's next version of it? And with Black land ownership, I feel that. I, I'm now calling people and email and I'm talking land folks and land trusts and people in conservation and, and people I never thought I'd be talking to. And I hear their excitement the same way we used to be hype about the shows we were going to throw and hype about meeting up and kicking it together and the ideas and the, the possibilities for the world. I'm meeting people that are into it. It's just in a different arena. And I still take the music to them. And when we have that space and we outdoors, finally we'll have an outdoor festival where I can see you. I can see my homies that rap. I can see my homies that dance. I can see my, and it's not this segmented partitioned. Yeah. Yeah. This community over here, that community over there, but now nah, where humans come together. And, and so I'm excited. I, I believe in the ebb and flow. And so we were there for heavy flow state. So we had the luck of seeing what it looks like on 15. So when people talk about, let's take it to level 10. Like, nah, we saw it on like exponent X. So that's dope. <laughs> yeah. So now, yeah, it, it's, it's like I long for certain parts of it, but I also remember I wasn't eating healthy. Mm -hmm. I wasn't sleeping right. I was involved in some non-healthy and some toxic relationships. I didn't really know myself as an artist in certain ways. It was hard. It was really hard. Certain parts were scary, like really, really, really scary. You know, I lost some friends in the process. Sorry. You know, I've lost some friends during that process. Yeah. And like, so, so I also got to remember, like, it was what it was. I celebrate it. But now we're also in a place to like next level, next level. And, yeah. and, and everybody got to make it with us, you know? Uh, no, I completely and, agree. And you touched on losing the friends there and you wouldn't believe how, how hard it's been to just even connect with that. It's almost like I blocked that part out for a long time and it was only in therapy, which I now pay for out of pocket because I've realized how important that element of 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 myself is and and all of us but that i've been able to re really connect and tap into like that's that aspect of it because we did lose people 
And we were in our 20s and 30s and we lost people to drugs, suicide and natural causes that were shocking as well. And that was so heavy that contrasted with everything else that was going on in in Brooklyn at that point in time, it was impossible to process it fully. And it's only now, in some cases, a decade later that I'll wake up, I'll have dreams with these people and I'll realize, wow, I need to address this. I need to like find a way to come to terms with that side of things. And the only way I've been able to do that is through um, core energetic therapy, which involves body movements as well and things like that. And it's just something that I had to dig into. And you think about how unhealthy we were too. It's like <laughs> I was eating junk food. I mean, way, way too much weed consumption, like like off the charts at times. And it's like, I don't even know how we made it. Like I, I, I teeth <laughs> destroyed, kidney stones. I mean, it it was not a healthy time either. A lot of a lot of like I said, junk food was a big factor because we didn't have money and yeah. It was right bodega there. Food. The bodega's yeah. right there. Exactly. And and like the the we literally had it all. Like we had trust fund folks. We had the older Rasa dude bringing more weed around than I ever seen in my life. Yeah. We had the the folks who were literally like studio rat. Like I only play music. I don't want to do anything else. We had the people that were just arts, you know, into arts and like hanging out. It was just such a an amalgamation of I think that artistic expression. Um, but I do have to remember the reality of what it was and and know that, like, I have to celebrate that. I was talking to Garrett. He came by. And, um, you know, when Brenner passed, like, that was serious for homies. But did, was I able to stop and really process that a man I was playing music with, like, one day, da 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 you know, with, with other people? I'm not going to go through everyone. But, like, <laughs> you know, whether, whether it was Jack and whether it was Dante was, you know, different folks that that we lost. Did I have the wherewithal at that moment to really know the effect it was having on me? And uh, I've been in therapy since the melanoma stuff. And part of it is for me to figure out what my life will be coming out and, and you know, with more time away from being diagnosed, like trying to get back to a normal life. And what do I want my life to be? And in this past couple of years, we lost some folks. And my therapist was, I was like, you know, maybe this is just normal. And she was like, no, you've lost a lot of people. And, and she was like, probably, it's, well, you know, a lot of people. Because I was also then questioning, what do I do? What am I doing in my life? And like, am, am I um putting myself in risky situations and this and that and she was like no you know a lot of people and you have an open heart and and you've met a lot of people and some of them had really rough breaks and and really sit with that and and i've worked with her a lot to to manage my guilt around the life i have now um and also manage the celebration and and to remember especially coming out of this cancer stuff who like every day we wake up, take a breath, let's celebrate the folks with us, the folks not with us. And let's 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 get to the business. And I don't mean to get to the money. I mean, like get to the business of what's in your heart, what's really important to you. How do you want to spend these 24 hours? How do you want if you're awake, 16 of them? How what do you want to do during that 16 hours? You know, who do you want to do it with? What's important to y'all and not just what's important to me, but what's important to y'all, the, the community of people? How do we work together? Yeah. Um, And and so that's allowing me to, to to take some time. I wrote a piece about like, I'm seeing ghosts and it was just this two week period where I could not stop thinking about people. And it, it normally doesn't happen for me like that. Normally it's like, you know, but like for two weeks, I just could not stop, you know, thinking of the homies. And, um, and I don't know if as young artists, because we think, or, or I feel like I'm making cathartic art, I'm making art to manage my difficulties. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have thought I also, might need to talk to a therapist. I wouldn't have thought also since I, you know, I'm not saying everyone needs a therapist, but I didn't talk to a priest. I didn't have homies I could really talk to that could understand. My mom is not, you know, she has a very um, insular perspective in a certain way and a very, a very awesome way of looking at the world, but she has no idea how we live in a certain way. Right. Um, and, and for me, it's helped to have someone to talk to and, and not just vent, but to, like to help, get more tools in my toolbox to manage the difficult situations I like to put myself in. Like I, I don't, yeah. I'm not here for easy life, you know, like, <laughs> right. It kind of goes back to where we started. Like there's, there's an easier way out. And, you know, for whatever reason, some people choose this more arduous and mentally taxing and, and deep type of experience. And there's consequences and you have to acknowledge those consequences. And I think it's physical and it's mental, it's emotional, it's spiritual, it's financial, 
And if you understand those those risks, then it's totally worth it. But if you don't and you don't manage them, then you're going to have some major problems. It's tough, but I would tell anyone who ever asked me, and especially in 2019, 2020, I sat with myself a lot and asked myself, A, am I proud of what I've done with my life? And what I thought most about were the people that made me proud that I've I've been able to meet. And what I really thought was like, I owe them. Like, like part of my life drive is to reimburse the people energetically who I've never met to fuel that energy that people gave me. Like, it's not even like I owe the people who gave me the energy. I owe the next group of people I've never met yet the energy given to me. Yep. And, and that's exciting. Like, cause there's a lot to be done in the world. Like we haven't maximized all the options. That to me is what's most exciting. If we've tried everything and it won't work, that's disheartening and frustrating. But right now it's not like there are all these venues who are trying to support da, 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 everything's falling in place and it doesn't work. It's like, Oh, nah, we got some obstacles, but if we can fill in these blanks, we out here. And, yeah. and, and that's exciting to me. Um, and, and when I think about moving forward, I have a high expectation. Like, yes. like, it's, it's like, I know how we can rock out. I know how little it takes for us to do stuff. I've seen you physically, you know what I'm saying? Like sweat, blood, like we make the thing. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, I know we can do it. Because when we had nothing, we did it. Now that people can even make $10,000 a year, $15,000 a year, $20,000 a year. I was with the homies that we buying dollar pizza and splitting it. Yep. You know, like like people who were literally they rent was four hundred dollars, six hundred dollars a month. They made six hundred and eighty dollars a month. <laughs> yeah, paying for things with quarters, like going down to like yeah. falafel places and buying like just the falafel balls using quarters. I mean, yeah. that's that's the reality, or at least it was. And yeah, it's just important to acknowledge it. No question about it. Yeah, so I'm excited now that we have a few resources. We we are in our minds more resourceful. Like think of all you've had to learn, bro, in the past 15 years in order to be where you are now. Like, yeah. it's amazing to me. So I, I'm 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 exhilarated looking forward. Um to say yeah. the least. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that because I saw the whole McKibben Street apartment ending and I was like, oh man, that's <laughs> that that could be taxing. I wanna before we go, I want to talk about black land ownership because you'd mentioned that it's taken on a a life similar to your art life in terms of bringing people together and you know the real estate component of it is also similar to the DIY art world where you're always looking for spaces and I've just been super impressed by this project I don't know if you could just kind of overview it what what inspired you to do to do this I mean it's kind of obvious but it's also like specifically how did you get into this and I know you've made some major progress on this project as well yeah. Um, it's another example, I think, of organic growth. I was touring and I'd done some tours that were in music venues and where there was more budget behind it. Uh, they weren't always so much fun. I had done some shows in people's houses while on those tours that were a lot of fun. And I was like, can I set up a no venues tour? And I started planning shows either in California, or Colorado, a couple of different places. Um, we went up to Rhode Island at one point and did a show with um, Jesse the Tree at, yes. at his house. Um, shout out, Jesse. And all the folks like Miles and all them, uh, there's a whole circuit of people that do house shows, you know? And and so that wasn't what hip hop folks that I was around were doing. We need big speakers. We need to be loud as possible. Yo, turn me up, son. That, right. you know, but you don't need that. And for the type of music I've been doing recently, I needed to be more connective. I need you to be able to look me in the eye while I'm telling you about these experiences my friends have or that I've had. Uh, and so I was in Colorado working on my friend's farm in order to, you know, stay for free. And then she set up three shows with her neighbors. One of them was with like a 55 year old Denver Broncos fan, blonde slash graying white hair, drinking beer one in the afternoon, didn't know anything about hip hop. But then she had all her friends come over and we do the show and it was amazing. Go hiking afterwards and I'm up in the mountains and I'm just looking at everything. And I've traveled before. I've been through a, you know, a lot of the country, but it was the first time where I was like, this is unbelievably and amazingly gorgeous. Who owns all this stuff? What, what, what is going on out here? And she's like, oh, Bureau of Land Management. Um, and that's private. I'm like, wait, people own mountains? And she's like, yeah, you just you can't do anything with it, but people own it. And it just <clears throat> immediately my brain was like, yo, space has been such an issue with music. That's why I'm partially moving out of my apartment now. I'm not going to fight to stay in an apartment where I can't do shows. I'm mm -hmm. just moving to a regular, you know, let it go. 
Um, and space is always an issue. Even when you have your own venue, your neighbors are calling the cops because it's too loud or people hang out in front smoking cigarettes. So I started thinking like all the problems that people are arguing about in the black community. Do we defund the police or do we work with the police? Do we start charter schools? Or do we keep public schools? Do we say keeping women safe is uh, making abortion illegal or is keeping women safe, letting them control their own bodies? Old black people aren't agreeing on that. And I'm tired of black people arguing with each other. So what can I do that's unifying? And I wrote a list of just all these different issues that I saw affecting the black community and asking my friends. And the one unifying platform I came across was land. No one was arguing about that. People weren't even really talking about it. And living in New York City, I didn't consider owning land. It was, what's the point? Like uh, the, the building right there is a million point three dollars and you still have to renovate it. And, you know, like that's not land. But I got in these areas where now you can get acres for 30,000. And of course, there's like, what do you do with acres? Like, I make rap music. You know, I, I draw, I take photos of people. I kick it with, with folks. Like, I'm in a city. Well, my mind started working it and being like, what can we do at this space? We can throw outdoor festivals. We can da 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 And I just started getting hype. But it came out of the same base of like, how do we gather and have a safe space? I don't. I think a lot of my friends don't go to rural areas because they're afraid of how black folks get treated out there. Well, if we own the land, then, you know, you're safe with us as much as, you know, humans can be safe with other humans. And and the other homies will come, too, because the way I do things, I you know, my, my vision of pan-Africanism and of pro-blackness is welcoming of all people. It's not an anti-anything. It's just a reality of for too many years there has been anti-blackness and a disparity in, in access and treatment and laws. So I have to, when I say pro-black, say I want to support the people that haven't been getting support. But but at Black Land Ownership, my partner's white. You know, the other homie on the board is uh, a Jewish immigrant from Russia. You know, the other homie is a blues player who's black from Indiana. Like we we want to bring folks together, but we got to look at why haven't we had the space? Why is it 96 percent of privately held rural land is owned by people of European descent? They don't make really? up 96 percent. That's of the a wild statistic. Yeah, bro. Not shocking, so that- but wild. When I got back, I was initially just like, we need land. And so I started researching the history of land ownership in America. And we did a timeline from 1820 till now. You can look on our website and you find it. And there's all this legislation. Oregon started as a no black state. Literally black people could not live or own property in Oregon when the state started. Now that's not a slave state. We you know historically we got told whether the Northern state slave states, at one point, New York state had more slaves than Georgia. Now they abolished slavery earlier than Georgia. But we don't own land up north because in the northern states, we moved for industry. We own land down south, but that's where it's segregated. So we're not involved in the finance and industry. So we lose our land in the south. So there were more black landowners of rural land in 1890 than now. And a person would say, well, that's just urbanism. No, 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 no. There's Who do you think owns that rural land we gave up? You know, and and so once I started learning the history and the statistics, it moved into a different direction. It wasn't just about me. It wasn't just about my homies being able to do a festival outside or having space to run in the woods. Uh, it was it was about a, a larger social issue and a, um, an issue that then gets into the schools, the police, our healthcare system, our food sustainability, hypertension, mental health, all types of things really come back to the land. Mm-hmm. And so we started pushing and saying, well, what can we do? We don't have any money. So we can't just buy land for people. First thing was education. Let's centralize all the information we can find. Let's talk to black architects. Let's talk to engineers. Let's talk to lawyers. Let's talk to developers. Let's put this information out in a way that's more accessible. And from a person that looks like me, that speaks like me, that has my interests where I'm not from landed money. I'm not an attorney. I'm not in real estate. I'm a nobody in the sense of I'm just regular Joe Parn Hash out here. Like I, I don't have anything coming to the table. And if I can figure it out, I know that people, you know, who who have things already can figure it out. And there are people way smarter than me who could then definitely figure it out. And for the folks who may not have have the uh, traditional education, like being able to read contracts like I can, or like my mom will or my cousin will, we got people to help out. And if you know how to build an engine, because I can't build an engine. So I'm not even saying like if you got to be smart, like like read legal stuff. But if you smart, and know how to build the engines. We found the homie that can do the paperwork. If you know how to do the paperwork, we find the homies that can build the engines and and start bringing that together and find the areas of the country that are amenable to, to diversity and that celebrate it. Because I drive through. There is not a single state I've been to in this country where I don't see Confederate flags, whether it's up north, out west, down south. Yep. 
in every place I've been, I also meet cool people. And I've, I've found communities where they're like, we don't care where you're from. If you're a cool person and you contribute to this community, we'll contribute with you and we're going to work together. We're going to live together. We're going to celebrate together. We're going to worship together. And and that's the part I like to, uh, to really amplify and expose that the country's big. We don't all need to cram into these seven or 10 major cities where we're paying rent to be threatened all the time by landlords. A lot of space. And with technology, we can now manage the water and the food production and and really have our own autonomy. So that's been inspiring. Like, it's just like when I used to hit up people like, yo, this music scene's important. I can be like, yo, this land issue is very important. And if we do it right, it then provides space for music scenes and for artists. And we have our artist residency now when, with to uh, give some, some on the ground. Uh, we purchased a 15 acre conservation property. No buildings on it. We can't build. And people are like, why would you do that? Well, we don't have to take care of it. Like we live in New York. I don't want to move out there. It would almost be um, unfortunate if we purchase a house we can't take care of out, out there. It's four hours away. But it's in conservation easement. It was only $20,000. We raised the money. We went through community. We were able over two years to raise the money. And now it's open to anyone who wants to come explore with us. So it's not this proprietary use of land. It's not exploitative. We're not going to start a farm. We're not farmers. Farming is very difficult. People that think like, get land, start a farm. Come talk to us. I'll, I'll introduce you to some farmers that can put you through some courses. And I think you'll get an idea if it's something you want to do. But we were able to get that space. But then it was like, so how do we grow from here? We saved money. Pandemic hit. I stopped drinking. We got donations. We invested in crypto at a time where it actually worked. And we're able to purchase a 22 acre property that would be our artist residency 10 minutes from the conservation land. We would not have been able to purchase that second property if we didn't take the leap of faith and buy the first property, sight unseen. I researched for years. So I knew the area. I had satellite footage. I had gone through the tax map. I had contacted public offices. I did my due diligence. I knew what it looked like, but I didn't know what it really was. So we got there. But it was amazing. Once we saw it and we saw that pristine nature, then that introduced us to the people in the area to put us in touch with the owner of the house that we ended up buying. Yeah. And through that, we're able to now have a hub and you can come up whenever you want. Two bedroom, two bath. We we whoo, renovated already, but our hands like you can't see it now. But my hands were peeling because I burned myself working on the house. But that's what we have to do. And it's fun. And that opens it up that I don't know how to do certain stuff. We bring up the homies and they do it. They teach the other homies. So my carpenter friends are teaching my other friends who've never used power tools. And then we play music. We we set up the bonfire and just play tunes. And there's no stress around that, you know? And and so that's that's the mission now is is land. My big goal is we want to raise five or six million dollars and buy seven thousand acres to turn into a research and development center outdoors in the middle of nowhere and bring out all the homies to teach their technology, to teach their methods and to own what they make. Um, and it's going to take a process. That's like the plan out here. We're starting here with two little properties and building, build and build. It's completely amazing. So anybody who wants to get involved in this, what's the best way to, to find information on their, on, what's your website, I guess. Blacklandownership.com. Everything's spelled properly. I answer all the correspondence. You email us, you check out our Instagram and come out. Like we have an art space in Brooklyn. That's, that's our hub here. Come see us in person. Come. I, I like to tell people, come really sit with me and, and see how real this is to me. Um, and, and check out the statistics. I did a lot to, and, and our partners did a lot to make it clear why this issue is important. I know folks will stop me and say, A, land ownership is faulty in the first place. And unless you're doing something to correct what happened to the indigenous Americans, then you aren't fully understanding the issue. One, I would ask people to come talk to me about my feeling about Africans coming over to the new world prior to Europeans and there being some overlap in who's considered indigenous and of African descent, as well as I do recognize there are groups and tribes that had nothing to do with Africans that were here. And we fight for them. We we hear from them. We try to spread the word on what happened to them when it comes to how women have had less access to property ownership. We're here to fight, you know, when it comes to how trans folks and folks in the queer community have been mistreated in some of these areas. We're here to fight. And part of that is come see us, come talk to me, come come let us know what your needs are. Let's build. Let's see how we can work together. Um, and if you're into hiking and camping, we started a hiking and camping club. If you want to buy land, we can give you resources into how to do it. We can put you in touch with uh, resources that aren't readily available in terms of alternative lending. And I don't mean me. Nothing I do is to get money out of people that are, like we don't offer a class like, hey, learn how to do it. Now, give me five hundred dollars. Nope. Anything you want to talk about. If I know it, I'll tell you for free. Um, 
but we can put you in touch with people where if you need to hire a lawyer, I can tell you who we hired and he did our paperwork, right? We got a binder with our LLC and we got the stamp. I know some people like legal zoom. I'm not saying nothing about it, but yep. I know my, when my mom was like, did you do it right? And I showed her the thing. She was like, wow, you're actually growing up, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and, and so come see us, come talk to us. If you can't come talk to us, I'll do Zoom calls. I do presentations for colleges. I go into schools. I have a lot of statistics that are are, are deep, depending on your interest. If you're more into how you finance land, if you're more into how you look at land as an asset, if you're more into sustainability, you want to start a farm, you want to start a school, you want to just uh, get into conservation. I'd love to share the information with you and put you in touch with the people who know way more than me. Chris Carr, you're a, a visionary of our time, a, a, a true artist. You know, that's at capital A, you know, there's no question about it. And always something amazing happening. That's what, that you are one of those people that, you know, just, you want to look to, you know, you want to look to for just feeling like we're moving forward as a, as a, as a society, you know? I appreciate it, brother. Yeah, I, I mean that. You know. I, I'm glad uh, you were you were able to give an opportunity with this platform. And I really and, and you know, oftentimes when people do the compliment exchange, it's for public. This is for you. Like this is just I, I don't get to be around you enough to really tell you when you were here for the festival. I didn't really get to sit down is I see you go out rain, sleet, snow, like like other than a postman <laughs> and asking the questions people do not want you to ask. But always understanding, I think that it's another human you're speaking to. And and in your version of journalism, seeing how you include the humanity and multiple perspectives and you give voice to certain, I think, perspectives and people that don't always have it, as well as you don't then dismiss the folks that people have heard and, and make sure that it's an actual conversation. And so I want to say I appreciate you and I appreciate your effort. And like, bro, you you. I'm only nine toes now, but you 10 toes down, 10 fingers down. Like, I, I really, I really appreciate you. It means a lot, man. It really does. So, all right, well, let's do this all again. Right. Thanks for, uh, thanks for making the time. All right, yo. And uh, be safe. I'm, I'm on the road again. So it's, even if it's not for shows, I will be seeing you soon. Cool. Let's do a show here. I'm, I'm in the same place where it's like, we may as well do shows. I have, it's a 1500 square foot loft space. We're doing show. I'm going to do shows here because I have that sense of, this isn't going to last forever. And we may as well, like you said, why pay to live in a place like this if we're not going to do shows? Like, there's no reason. I'll just go live in an apartment somewhere. Yeah, brother. All right. Well, good. Right. Good. Here, tell, tell everybody, tell the family, I say, what's up? Likewise. All right. Peace. All right. See you. The legalization of recreational cannabis going into effect this week can open doors for your career. If you are already in the industry or wondering what the best path to break into the cannabis field is, well, the University of Rhode Island has a program to help you become highly competitive in numerous areas of the cannabis industry. Fully accredited by URI's College of Pharmacy, the certificate program is 100% online and can be completed in two semesters. The next application deadline for the summer 2023 session is April 4th, and courses start May 9th. Learn more at uri.edu slash online slash cannabis or give them a call at 401-874-5280. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com employers.